Judge Debevois is a senior judge in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. Nominated in 1979 by President Carter, he has had a long career in a variety of legal capacities after a shorter but no less distinguished military career. While at Williams, he entered active duty with the U.S. Army, serving in the combat engineers, and was released in 1945 at the rank of sergeant with a Bronze Star Medal. After graduating from Columbia Law, he served in the Korean War as a first lieutenant. He began his legal career in 1952 as a clerk for Chief Judge Philip Foreman of the U.S. District Court at Trenton. He then spent 26 years in private practice at a firm that came to bear his name. During this time, he was actively involved in the civil rights movement, recruiting New Jersey attorneys to work with the Lawyers' Constitutional Defense Committee, representing civil rights workers in Mississippi during the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer. From 1969 to 1974, he served as a trustee to Williams during a pivotal time in the college's history. I would like to thank the college for including Trina and our four daughters in this event. Actually, the four daughters are our major contribution in life, so it was wonderful to have them here. Next, I'd like to mention three professors who have had a continuing influence on my career and life during the years since I left Williams. Professor Emile Dupre, who was an economics professor and introduced uh, Keynes economics, which was then a new and novel subject. Professor Vincent uh, Barnett, who taught constitutional law happily at a time right after the revolution in constitutional law, which took place in the Roosevelt years. And finally, a professor whose courses I never took, uh, Professor Miller, uh, the philosophy professor who had such a profound influence on one of my classmates that this classmate, John Mortimer, uh, passed them on to me and introduced me uh, to two Protestant theologians, Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich. Uh, professor Miller was not a religious person, but his thoughts and thinking led John Mortimer to lead me uh, to Niebuhr and Tillich. Uh, next, I would just like to mention the city in which I've my entire, almost uh, entire professional career has been centered, a uh, city of Newark, New Jersey, uh, which has gone from a descent into the depths and has now risen again uh, to, I won't say uh, the peak, but it's heading in that direction. And perhaps I could tell you a brief story uh, from the times in Newark, and this was at the depths uh, from which it has arisen. Uh, took place in 1965, two years before the riots, which were the catalyst for change. And it's the story of Lester Young, Long. Uh, the city was in deep turmoil racially, hostility on all sides. The police were sort of the spearhead of one side of the struggle. And one evening, Lester Long was traveling along in his uh, rather noisy automobile and at Broadway and Oriental Avenue, uh, Henry Martinez, a police officer and his patrol member, stopped, Hen stopped uh, Lester Long, pulled him over, took Lester to the back seat of the patrol car while they checked out his uh, arrest warrants. He had a few for traffic violations. Uh, Henry Martinez came back to the patrol car, and for some reason, Lester Long leaped out of the car and ran off. Henry Martinez raised his gun, fired it, and shot Lester Long right through the back of the head. Uh, he fell to the sidewalk, uh, startled uh, passers-by, saw the episode. Uh, the problem was not only the shooting of Lester Long, it was the reason the police gave for it afterwards. Uh, they explained that Henry Martinez had tripped, uh, the accidentally the gun went off, and Lester Long was shot. Uh, the persons who saw this event knew perfectly well that wasn't the case, and immediately the falsehood of the police account uh, was recognized, and this inspired uh, the civil rights movements, the black community, uh, into uh, a renewed uh, turmoil, organized uh, demonstrations. Uh, the Police Benevolent Association, the PBA, did the same thing. They organized demonstrations in support of uh, Henry Martinez, and it resulted in two rival groups, uh, the civil rights groups, the black community seeking the indictment of Henry Martinez, and the other groups 
uh, supporting Henry Martinez, bringing in police officers from wide area of the state, wives, children of policemen, and these two groups uh, were uh, marshalling. Uh, James Farmer, a noted civil rights leader, came into the city. He was head of the Congress of Racial Equality uh, to support the uh, local community. Uh, Robert Curvin, a young black activist, uh, was involved in the, the local core. Um, the fight went on. Uh, Henry Martinez was not indicted. That made pamphlets describing him as a murderer uh, somewhat uh, problematical. Uh, Henry Martinez sued uh, James Farmer, Robert Curvin, National Corps, local Corps, uh, for $3,750,000. Uh, I represented James Farmer and National Corps. A friend of mine represented uh, Robert Curvin and local Corps. Happily, the uh, attorney for uh, Henry Martinez met a terrible uh, tactical error. He sought an affidavit from a Catholic priest Father Everett, uh, because it would bolster his view that the community was behind uh, Henry Martinez. The Catholic priest wasn't uh, hostile to police officers generally. In fact, he associated with them quite frequently, but members of his uh, parish uh, would have been offended by this because they were part of the uh, community affected by the police conduct. Uh, so he refused to give the affidavit. Uh, testifying as to the uh, activities of the civil rights group seeking uh, the suspension of Henry Martinez and seeking his indictment and seeking the creation of a police review board. The tactical error was that uh, the attorney uh, for Henry uh, Martinez got hold of Father Everett at a, a party sponsored by the sheriff's office and once again demanded that the priest give, a, uh, give an affidavit. The priest again refused, at which point an enraged attorney told him that national, or the Police Benefit Association was supporting the lawsuit. Uh, they were supporting Henry Martinez, and they were going to destroy uh, National Corps. They were going to destroy James Farmer. They were going to destroy local uh, Corps and uh, uh, Robert Kervin. Uh, still, the, police, the uh, priest refused to give the affidavit, so the uh, enraged attorney uh, subpoenaed him to take his deposition. Uh, they took his deposition and he gave his account, perfectly accurate account of what had taken place when the civil rights groups were seeking the uh, suspension of Martinez and the creation of a police review board and seeking the indictment. Uh, so this he gave his testimony Then I was able to bring out on cross-examination the fact that the attorney for Martinez had disclosed that the entire purpose of the suit was to destroy National Corps, to destroy local Corps, uh, and these two people. Well, that did not help the posture of the uh, plaintiff in the case. They attempted, they brought a motion to suppress his testimony and to destroy all the tapes and the transcripts of it. The judge granted uh, the motion, but the damage was done because it was out uh, and the, uh, uh, they could not be put back in the uh, bottle again. Uh, as a result, instead of obtaining $3,750,000 uh, against the two uh, men and the local or, and the organizations, they settled for $2,500 and the case went away. Then it's sort of interesting to see what happened to these people afterwards. James Farmer continued as a noted civil rights leader, later a professor and an organizer of uh, integrated communities. Robert Curvin, the young black activist, became an editor of the New York Times, became an executive of the Ford Foundation, uh, in charge of funneling uh, money to urban, urban centers. I next saw Henry Martinez when they were dedicating the uh, courthouse in which I sit, which had been aptly named the Martin Luther King Jr. Courthouse, and there in the front row of dignitaries honoring the Reverend Martin Luther King was Henry Martinez. He'd been elected to Newark City Council and was actually at that time president of the Newark City Council. Of course, in the meantime, uh, Lester Long lay forgotten in his grave. Uh, one final note, uh, I have a law clerk today who's of an inquiring mind and searching for meaning in his life, so I've referred him to Reinhold Niebuhr, 
and Paul Tillich. Thus, uh, Professor Bordet, Professor Miller, Professor Desprez are continuing to teach. <laughs> <laughs>